chin knitwears when they are in Norway. And why should Norway invest their money into knitwear when they produce or they extract a lot of oil and gas? Most of the time it's cold and bad weather. Yeah. But are there any links between oil and gas extraction and knitwear production? Completely none. So if you could put money into different assets where there are no links between them, some will go up, some will go down, but if you're lucky, those going down will compensate or be compensated by those going up. So there are two important rules when you want to diversify your portfolio. One, in assets that varies in opposite direction or where there are no link between them, what we call neutral. So if you have a lot of money now that you don't know where to put, put it into Norwegian knitwear or something else. Okay? What is debt and what is equity? Is simply if you run a business, you cannot pay fully for it, then you have a debt. But at the same time you generate money and don't use all of it, that is equity. So if you meet with somebody who has equity and you want to finance a debt, the two can cooperate. One have the money, the other one wants the money. So that's what is it. Okay, the problem is risk. And what is the risk problem is simply this. The man, the man with the equity or the money don't know how risky business this guy is running. So what he does not know yet, he's the head of the Sicilian Mafia and the police are chasing him and in a few days he will be in jail and where will your money be if that guy is in jail? Lost forever. So that is the problem with finding somebody who are willing to, borrow, to lend you the money, you need them to, let's say, finance your activities, you need a debt instrument. We call this financial markets. The easiest way to organize this is, of course, through organization or institution already in place. So if you meet somebody at the street and say, oh, oh hey guy, I need a million Norwegian kroner, could you lend it to me? The answer would be, no, ask my bank. Then you get rid of the problem. Uh, very often uh, you can get a loan in a bank if somebody guarantees <coughs> for your loan. I have a, uh, a Danish colleague who always said like this, if somebody came up to him and said, I need a guarantee to lend money, could you help me? And he said, oh, I would love to, but I promised my mother on the last days that I should never guarantee for any loan. So remember that one. If you have a lot of money, be very careful with whom you lend it out to. But they did in the US. They put a lot of money into the housing market. Why did they do that? It's because of This is not oxygen, it is zero. What was the interest level in US around the year 2000? Zero. zero. Then you get the money for free. So wherever you find somebody who is willing to lend money, you get more from lending it out and get it for free from the federal state. It sounds a little bit interesting, doesn't it? You need not be a member of the Japanese Mafia to know that this could be money in. So they did. So there were free money available. Where should we put them? We have already filled in all the options. One left. The problem for Americans will be they have no housing. Unlike what you think, it's cold also in the US. So if it's cold, you need housing. So there are a lot of people interested in funding house buying, and they did. Should they have done it? Okay, so the answer is no. 
the tricky question is, should the American federal system bail out the banks? You will have one and a half hour before you get the answer. Okay? So it is a way to fund activities where those who have money meet those who do not have money and they join together and they, let's say, are involved in transaction. But they are risky. And there are portfolios uh, options that you should look for. So the first time you have a million euros back home, promise me one thing, don't lend it to one person. Okay. Then it's better to buy a Norwegian nuclear producer in addition. Yep. You know what a bond is? Okay, a, de a deposit is? If you look up your bank account, there is a deposit yet, I hope. Oh, nothing left? Okay. <laughs> Fill it in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, ask the Norwegian oil fund to get a few uh, quids so you can survive the last week. Okay. Stock is also another one. So you can have shares of stock. Uh, all these are equity instruments. We use them to fund either consumption or investment. And then comes the question for those who have a cause in macroeconomics. What are the differences between consumption and investment? In fact, there is only one dimension that differs. The time. The time. So in, uh, consumption is now. Yes. I paid money for some services or goods now. Use it now. Investments is normally for future things. Yeah. So if you turn around, you see consumption, fun light, will not last for a year. If it's an investment, you look at the wall. It lasts for more than one period. But it is a consumption, interporate inter inter consumption. So investment is, in fact, long-term consumption. That's it. OK? So nations will need money to buy either for consumption or investment. As we said, Norwegian oil and gas extraction. Is this much? Depends on 70% of what? Of 100. One sixth. Okay? The first big Norwegian oil field discovered was the Ecofisk. For those of you who are confused with the Norwegian, this is named by an American that did not have a Norwegian course or cultural language. Okay? The point was they should name all the oil fields in this area after fishes. This American thought there must be a fish called Echo. No. It should have been called either with double K, which was the professor on Norwegian television that spoke about it and called it Ecofisk with a double K. That's wrong. It's called Echo. If it has been American, because he was an American, it should have been called Echo. But this was the first big field that he found in Norway, offshore, on the continental shelf. It is an elephant. You know what an elephant is? A very big one. So it is one of the biggest oil fields discovered in the Norwegian oil sector. Okay? The idea was in 1969 to produce 17% of the 100% of resources down there. Okay? I think it would have lasted to, let's say, 1979 or 85, somewhere in that. Are they still producing or, or extracting oil and gas from the Ecofisk field? Yes. For how long? Probably 20 more years. So instead of 85, we talk about, and the reason is, or oh, let's be, 
How much more is 17 compared to 52? What is most? More than three times. So the extraction period is not 20 years, but 60 years. Thanks to American technology, the American assets that we needed to produce oil and gas, or extract oil and gas. What happened? Well, what happens if you try to extract oil and gas? Is that you need pressure, tools, and let's say something up there that can contain what comes up. I think it was deep sea horizon, wasn't it? The deep water, was it? What do you know about deep water horizon? Not much. I think it was an offshore platform. Yeah? Where was it? Uh, Mexican. Mexican Gulf. Why is it known? It's blown up. Yeah. Blown up. What is down here? Is something under strong pressure. So you have to control the pressure. What happens if this pressure diminishes? Less and less comes up. What can you do to improve the extraction? Is send down water or CO2. Increase the pressure from down low. So you need either new technology or different techniques to do this. We did that. So instead of extracting about 17% for 20 years, three times, and probably for more than 60 years, or close to 60 years, at least 50, okay? So this is an asset we got from US to improve our, let's say, production by investments that we could not do ourselves in the 1969 period. But now we can do it because we have used the asset and developed new techniques and new assets to produce more. So why do we do this? It's simply because we expect in the future to get more out of our assets than we do today. Why do we expect more in the future? Well, let's turn it around. Do you have any friends that would you lend you money with no cost at all? Okay, then they are very good friends. If you ask for two millions, will they still offer you this free? If they have it. Okay. <laughs> so then you have to go to the bank. Do you think the bank will offer this for free? No. They did by the federal system in US around 2000. They had so much money. No one were willing to invest it in anything. We already had the options. So how do we solve the problem of being a financial institution with a lot of free money and no one wanting to borrow it? Yes, generate a new market of housing. And here we go. And if you ask a Spanish young student, was this wise? Okay, you had a question. I got a question because yeah. you say they um, took the zero uh, percent uh, uh, interest rate because of they want to create uh, a new market. But it was, I think, also a reason because of the dot com uh, bubble. They uh -huh. want to solve this problem, so uh, by avoiding uh, uh, crisis, they uh, lower the interest rate more and more, and through this they so um, maybe parallel uh -huh. they uh, uh, give the opportunity for the housing market to establish a new bubble. So, um, yes, this was not the first bubble. Dot com was not the first bubble. There is bubbles in 87. I think there is one in 93. So there are several bubbles. So there are periods where there are more money available 
then there are, let's say, uh, somebody who is willing to pay for it. There are periods where there are a lot of activities that they want to fund, and they lack the money. So that creates a bubble. Okay? Probably the first bubble that didn't in, in, in a bubble was the Silicon Valley, 1960s. And they came up with HF. And what is HF? It's at the end of this chapter, chapter 21. You will see it one day if you read the whole of the textbook. It's a hedge fund. What is a hedge fund? It's simply somebody have the money, they don't know where to invest it, but they know some with ideas, and they put the money into the ideas. And what we get out of this is, okay, have you heard of Microsoft? Okay, Apple, things like that. So it was very good ideas from young, brilliant, I'm afraid girls, male students that had these ideas and no money. Then there were a lot of people with a lot of money and lacking ideas. So they meet in this market where there are money in a hedge fund to fund the ideas. Okay? Uh, I think the most famous one is Apple, because that was also in the movie. Forrest Gump. You haven't seen it? Okay. When he <laughs> talked about the friends of his that went to Vietnam and was, uh, in the, oh, he was uh, disabled when he came back home and he invested his money into some fruit company, he said. It was Apple. So Apple is a fruit, but it's not a fruit company. That was a hedge fund funded idea. Are there still somebody with some ideas like that out there? Yes, of course. Are they here in Norway? The answer is not, as far as we know. If I look at the Norwegian and say, do you know what GSM is? Why is GSM now internationally known? Yes, this was a Norwegian idea, a Norwegian technology. that was bought by Nokia. In those days, they were producing tires, Hakka Pelita, and boots. If you ask somebody to go into a Nokia shop and ask for a Hakka Pelita or boots, they would say, what is that? They don't know what it is. It was Norwegian technology, tested out in Paris. Why in Paris? Because those with the money they are in Paris. So what they did was actually using this system within the high buildings in the center of Paris to prove it works. And it ended up as Nokia. And Nokia became one of the biggest cell phone producers in the beginning, based on Norwegian technology. Had the Norwegian oil fund existed, they might have bought the idea. But who should produce it? We have no tire producer in Norway. We have a boots producer, but they went bankrupt in the 70s. I think it was called Viking. Yeah. This is an idea where you find the money, call it a hedge fund, and then you start to produce. So they, this is maybe the most important part for Krugman et al. to say financial markets are needed to make trade profitable, more expanding, and probably gaining everybody, at least those with the idea. But if you want to see the guy with, who invented the GSM, you can look up on the internet. It was a bright student from, I think it was in Western Norway, I'm not sure, but he studied in Trondheim. They went to Paris, produced the idea for different firms. Nokia got the idea to develop it and became one of the biggest. Do you think Nokia is one of the biggest now? No. So over time, thing changes. But to a start, this was vital to have the money, because the idea is bright, and somebody had to develop it. Okay. This is not the first time the Norwegians 
because this was, must have been in 1980s, had been invited to put money into a risky business. First time was in Drummond. It's not far from Oslo. It's further away than Gardermoen, but it's not far from. They were invited in by the American telephone companies in 1890s to be part of this production. Guess what the Norwegians said? No. <coughs> it could be a nice thing for housewives who have a lot of spare time to use it for fun. But we can see no reason why this could be a very profitable investment. Were they right? No. So not all of us can see what investments could end up with. So therefore, hedge fund has the advantage of you need not know anything about the idea, but you have to believe in, the, let's say, the environment where the ideas pops up. Not all of the ideas might be successes, but there are enough ideas in this market that at least one of them will be successful. As we said, only two of them needed to be a success. Because in the beginning, this was one company, two guys. I think it was, uh, according to the history, in a garage, but I'm not sure. Then it must have been a big one. Both ideas turn out to be a success. One of the biggest or the biggest company right now, bigger than Exxon. So yes, we need a financial market to fund ideas like this. Is it worth the money? Steve Jobs is there, don't ask him. Bill Gates is out of Microsoft. But I don't think he regrets the idea of developing Microsoft. So yes, we need financial institutions because this is the way to expand trend, trade. Making money internationally, being even the biggest company but it started as an idea in Western US, California, Silicon Valley. Okay? So for all I know, there are three or four great ideas here. One French, one German, one Italian, one Dutch. That one day will end up in a garage. And <laughs> with a hedge fund funding. And then I can get my wheelchair at a very low price because the technique you develop is reducing the cost of developing wheelchairs. So would that be a deal? You come up with a new technique for <coughs> wheelchairs, and since we meet just that day, you have one extra for me. Okay. So that is what it is about. We need money. Some of us have the idea. Not the same nations need to have the money with an international financial system. <coughs> okay. You know what a commercial bank is? What well, the difference between a commercial and a saving bank? If you have a commercial bank, it's owned by the stock or shareholders. If you have a saving bank, it's owned by the shareholders because there are no shares, no, no stocks. It's only shares. So Norwegian saving banks are owned by the society. So the society is represented in the, uh, the board of the saving banks. So it's not owned by somebody, but by groups. OK? So that's the difference. Then we have corporations. Corporations. You know what Coca-Cola is? OK? Uh, I have heard of Toyota. The reason why I mention is my car is not, as you think of Volvo, but uh, yeah. But this is not funded by the Nike Bank. OK, yeah. So they will have a lot of money that they do not use at all times, so they can lend it out. Then you have non-bank financial institutions. Give me two examples of a non-bank. Stock market. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you have a travel insur insurance, travel insurance? You know, 
insurance. Yeah, you can, yeah. So insurance companies are one, okay? So institutions with a lot of money that they can lend out and not being a bank could be another one. So the traditional ones I think of is insurance company. Okay, then you have central banks and government agencies. If you look at the Norwegian, they are in action with the Norwegian agency, public or governmental agency. They don't know the name of it, if you ask them. But every time they spend money that they do not own themselves, it's because they have a loan or support from the Norwegian State Bank for Funding Studies. We call it Lånekasse. So that is a state or governmental agency. Okay? My house was bought in 1973, eight years before I moved in. Paid by a Norwegian agency, a governmental agency, called Husbanken, the housing bank financing system. Uh, this is a newspaper. We have a Norwegian agency funding newspapers like this called Staten Slonekasse for Aviser. That was the Norwegian. It's just a lo loaning agency for newspapers. So these are the alternatives that you can come up with. If you ask the Norwegians why they prefer this to this or this, the answer is very simple. As long as I'm a student, I do not have to pay interest. When I start to pay back the loan, the interest level is normally lower. So therefore, governmental agencies offer you cheaper money, but on special conditions. So it won't help you to knock on the door. They are down in Ørsta, I think. Oh, I'm out of money. I'm a student. Why don't you speak Norwegian? Because I'm a German student. I'm sorry. Go back home. So that is why we have it. We want to have, let's say, extra money for those who are trying to get an education and want it to be cheaper than using the regular financial system. Okay? Do they only lend money to Norwegians? Yeah, for study uh, funding, yes. But we have a system called NORAD, which is the International Norwegian Aid System, where you also have a government agency lending money to, not Germany, but a former colony, a colony of Germany called Tanzania. They could lend money from a Norwegian agency. So these are where you can fund activities. Okay, non fund <coughs> yes. Do you know what a pension fund is? Okay. Yeah, one day. I already are looking forward to it working. Okay. Uh, you know this is offshore on the Norwegian continental shelf. You know what they produce is sent by pipelines to Germany, UK, Netherlands, Belgium and France. Do you know who owns this pipeline system now? Russia. No, one of these three. Why well, is not a hedge fund? I think you realize very soon because this is not a new idea. So hedge fund won't be in there. Who will be in there? Maybe insurance. Yeah, could be, but isn't. Pension. Yes, the Canadian pension fund owns these pipelines. Why on earth is the uh, Canadian pension fund owning a pipeline system in the Norwegian sector of the North Sea? Maybe it's beneficial. Yeah, and why is it beneficial? It generates money. Yeah, and for the oil company that built this, it generates too little money. But if you are a Canadian pension fund, you can survive by less than an oil company. So the oil company need more money, let's say, to uh, provide new pipelines, new production units and things like that. But for the Canadians, they are looking for the most prosperous place to pay, put their money, 
and that is pipelines in the North Sea. Life ain't easy. You don't believe it. They do. This is the cer most certain generator of money that the Canadian pension fund came up with. Compared to what could you have done in Canada, hunt beers, hunt in German or French tourists, this is certain money. They will produce for 20 more years. So for 20 years they generate money for the Canadian pensionists. I think they're happy with it. You have more money. So yes, funds will be one of the non-bank system. More and more of this will be pension funds. And you have to blame it on me. Because more and more of us survive after stopping producing. And they call it a pension aid. And since there are more and more of us, you need more and more money also in Canada and then invest in them. Okay? Hedge funds, you only think of Microsoft or Apple. So if you don't remember what hedge fund is, just think of Microsoft and Apple. It's just a way to get money to pay for a very good idea. Have you seen Discovery? Atlantis. What was Discovery and Atlantis? Space shuttles. Why would you think that that would not be the best idea to invest money into? How many of you plan to go into space in the nearest future? Not too many of you. I think one of you might end up on Mars, which is a planet. But if I look around, the probability that one of you will be one of them is all point point, 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 very low. If I should choose between a space shuttle and Airbus, I would prefer Airbus. Not because it's in France, but simply because there are more people flying across the globe than it is between planets. <coughs> so therefore it's more profitable. So some ideas is not worth putting money into. Okay? Therefore, hedge funds meet ideas and develop new products, which is an investment and probably investment because it lasts more than one year. That sounds like uh, pop music. Three weeks in the top of the charts and then it's over. No, this is a long time lasting investment. Okay. If you want to know what page you should start to read when it comes to chapter 21, it is 597. So remember that if you want to link to a currency area and fix the rate, it has to be close links. Okay, what are the problems with the future is it's uncertain. Uncertain and unpredictability. What are the difference between something being uncertain and unpredictable? If it's uncertain, you must have a vague idea what is uncertain. So space shuttle is number of passengers will go down after a few years than out of business. Unpredictable simply means you cannot calculate on it. It's impossible to do calculations. Okay? So that is one problem. The other is unstable. And I'm afraid, Fabio, we don't think of Germany when we say unstable prices. And I hope you excuse us for that. History has changed, but unpredictable simply means you have no idea what will happen in the future. Unstable is, you know something will happen in the future, but you don't know what direction. So these are the two most uncertain elements of an investment. 
Okay? In a large area, uh, there has to be trade relative to output to get into the market with a fixed rate. Two, if you are in a market where you soon can get you a new job, then it's easier to avoid unemployment. But if not, you run into problems. What happens if people do not earn money as the purchasing power is reduced? What happens to inflation if there is no consumption? It shifts from inflation to... If it's not inflation, it means increasing prices. Deflation, uh, decreasing. So deflation simply means there are less and less purchasing power. That's the problem of Europe right now. Okay? So, before you leave, remind me of what was the advice for the Swiss government. You know what a branch is? Okay. Do you know what SO is? Have you seen a Norwegian petrol station called Esso? Okay, then you know it's a petrol company. Do you know what the name of the petrol company was in the beginning, more than a hundred years ago? Standard Oil. Owned by an American called John D. Rockefeller. What do you about know about Rock John D. Rockefeller? Not much, okay. He was the richest man in the world which in those days mean in the US, because he owned Standard Oil. They were not allowed to continue. So then we got Exxon. We got Mobile. I think we got Caltex. So these are one, two, three, of the seven biggest oil companies in the 60s. But it was owned by one company at one time. So then you have new companies, but it was branches of the same company. Guess where Caltex was located? This is to the clever of you. The company was called Caltex because it was in? California, Texas. Yes. Well, Mobile was in a different place. The one company at the off. is now called Philips Conoco. In those days, it was Philips. In fact, it was Philips 66. OK. These are new companies. But they merge together. But normally, we think of a big company being split up in branches or smaller units. OK? What is a subsidiary? Subsidiaries. Very often, we call them daughter companies. What is an agency? The Norwegian. Staten Slonikas is an agency. So they are different forms that represent, let's say, banking systems. Not oil companies, but banking systems. Why do we call them offshore banking systems? Why do banks have to have offshore banking systems? They are located in several countries mm -hmm. uh, under several conditions of uh, agreements and uh, law systems. Yeah, so they are regulated in different regulator, uh, regulatory regimes in different countries. So therefore, they have to be different from countries to country because they operate under different rules. A branch is simply owned by the bank. A subsidiary is simply a daughter company that is a bank in a certain country. An agency very often cooperate with a domestic bank institution. Okay? So depending on the regulations, they can either be owned by the bank 
or a daughter company of the bank or cooperating with other banks. <coughs> How do we regulate a financial system? We don't let the mafia operate them because they have also a banking system, but I don't think that would know. You know the reason why we do regulate banks are very easy to come up with. One, international production varies from period to period. We call it a shock, and it's a quick change in period. Since we are in the oil branches, there are two shocks. Caused by, yeah, what happened in 1973 was the first oil price shock, where the oil price tripled in a few days. The oil producing countries, uh, formerly known as OPEC, uh, reduced the amount of uh, sold or uh, produced oil. Sold to the Western European countries. Why did they stop selling oil to the Western countries was there was a war nearby. Yom Kippur. And none of you are very good in Hebrew, are you? But it was a war between Israel and their Arabic neighbors. And then OPEC decided to reduce the, uh, the, uh, the export of oil and the oil price went up three times. What happens to the industries in Western Europe? and Western world is then energy prices triple, profit crumbles, you run into problem. We call it a real shock. Okay? What was the second oil price shock caused by? It was uh, the war in Kuwait, I think. No, that was later. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Saudi Arabia. Mm, no, very good. It, but it was further north. A priest returned from Paris in 1979. Guess where he went? Iran. Iran. Ayatollah Khomeini. He was staying in a suburb in Paris, I think. Went home to Iran, and that caused a shock. It's a little bit strange that the priest would cause a shock like that. It's more or less like the return of Jesus, I think, almost. But it was a shock. Double, no, triple the oil price once again. At the same time, there was a president in the nearby country of Iraq called Saddam Hussein. He decided to invade Iran. Was that a wise thing to do? Did he win the war? No. Did he lose the war? No. It was more or less a draw, so to speak. But it increased the oil price three times. We got a new oil price shock. And that is what is a problem with international activities. There could be shocks like that. OK? For the first time in period, US decided not longer to regulate capital flow into US. Why is that a problem? Is what do you? buy things for in the US? What do you need to buy goods in the US? Yeah. What do you need to buy oil on the international oil market? Dollars. So they reduce the control of flow of dollars. And the dollar exchange rate was no longer regulated. Uncertain caused a new shock. And then we'll have a break. When we just add this, what happens to your bank if they s no longer can, let's say, guarantee you access to the money at a certain given exchange rate? I will take out my money from the bank. Yeah. Who took their money out of the American banks in this period was Saudi Arabia. Do you think Saudi Arabia had a lot of money? Yes, they had. What did that cause? to problems for international trade was simply it reduced the certainty of American dollars and reduced the activity of trade. 
in addition, Saudi Arabia stopped buying uh, American commodities too. Okay, so yes, do not change the financial system. Or well, if you do, you need to expect shocks out of it. Two minutes left. There are differences between international transactions and national transactions. If you are in North Korea, you are under both regulations. You are not allowed to buy dollars in North Korea if you want to. So don't go to the nearest bank if you are in North Korea and ask for dollars or a yen or something like that. So these are international control, but most of the national domestic controls can take place, for instance, in countries like Norway in this period. We talk about 1979, 1980. <coughs> the problem is, where will money flow when they flow freely? Is into the market where there are least regulations. So where did it flow in these days? We talk about 1980, long before you were born long before your plans to start studying economics, long before you decided to go to Norway. Where did the money flow when it was taken out of the American banks in this period? Why London? because it's the least regulated capital or financial market, both in this period and nowadays. Guess why UK do not want to enter into the Euro system? So they want a free transaction world for financial institutions located in London. And their worst fear is it will be taken over by Paris or Milan or may God forbid it, even Frankfurt. So therefore, they stick to a very little regulated financial system where the money flows. If you wonder if it's profitable, we will have 15 minutes to come up with an answer. But some of you have been to London. Never, okay. For those who have been to London, explain to the other students why this seems to be a very profitable activity. Okay? See you in 15 minutes. Or should we say 14? 